Ladies and gentlemen, big, big round of applause for Ms. Manisha Koirala. Sir, please honor, do honor us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Shri Sadhguruji. said I'm well liked, but <laughs> <laughs> when see these I days, these days even tigers need to be protected, so <laughs> <laughs> It's a huge honor, uh, Sadhguru, Guruji, um, I've never done this before, um, so please be gentle <laughs> <laughs> Um, <clears throat> how do I begin? Uh, I have many, many, many questions, Guruji. They have set a, yeah, the clock ticking. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to uh, fit within this theme of conversation of taking pride. And one question that really comes to me very strongly is that um, we, you know, India and Nepal is very rich in culture and spiritual heritage. Instead of taking pride, why do we always look towards West? And uh, whereas I find a lot of West, West is looking towards us for answers, but we I feel are constantly looking towards West. Your views on this, Guruji? I can't see the audience, but uh, I'm sure at least almost all the men, ninety-five percent of the men are in Western clothes right now. Ladies are a little better <laughs> Why is this? Because we must understand there is no substitute for success. Okay. You may talk philosophies, you may talk culture, you may talk so many things, but there is no substitute for success. Right now, in many ways, West has become the symbol of success. So if you're successful, even though the temperatures are thirty-eight degrees today, you must be in jacket and tie. I'm not commenting on their clothes, I'm saying success is the ideal always. Without what is successful, that is what everybody will aspire for. So we need to understand this. 
Another aspect of success is today, success means economic success. People are not recognizing any other form of success anymore on the planet. There used to be a time, if you came into a town and said, oh, he's a big man, maybe he was a wise man, maybe he was a very creative man, maybe he was something else, but no. Today, if you say somebody is a big man, it means he's got big money bags. Yes. So, in a way, we have transformed the entire world into economics. That is the most important subject everywhere. So it doesn't matter, there's no point struggling with it. We have to come to terms with it and see how to write it. So we need economic success. You will see as India becomes more economically successful, you will see things Indian will become more prominent. It's not the other way around. People think that if India becomes economically successful, everybody will become westernized. It's not true. Unless by then we have completely lost the ethos of what India is. If we did not lose that, then definitely as economic success comes, manifesting who we are, it becomes equally important. To take pride, there are certain mechanics. First of all, when you, you mention the word nation, nation is not just a geographical boundary. Right. It is an idea that we must infuse into people's minds, it must burn as a pride in people's hearts, then only there is a nation. If you just draw a pencil line on the map, it doesn't become a nation. So to build pride, there is… there has to be history. No nation has as much history as we have, but our children as… when you were studying in school, you studied nothing of to be proud of. If you just look at it recently, I was talking to the education minister in Tamil Nadu, for example, everybody knows about Cambodia, Angkor Thom and Angkor Wat. These temples are the engineering marvels, even by today's standards, most incredible things that human beings can create. Tamil kings went there and built it. From first standard to twelfth standard, does any Tamil child even read one line saying that our ancestors went there and built this? No. We only study how people came and conquered us, raped us, looted us and this is what we study. A fourth standard child in Lebanon will know, fourth, fifth standard, those three years they study this, every one of them know Indian labor, Indian sculptors, Indian yogis and Indian elephants came to Lebanon 4,200 years ago and built the Baalbek temple which is a phenomenal structure even today. Every child in Lebanon knows it to a point, there are thousands of people in Lebanon who take their first name as Hind. Here we shout Jai Hind, there's no one Hind here, but in Lebanon there are thousands of people named Hind because they feel these people from somewhere came and built this temple and even today there are thousands of people by that name. You go further into the now, uh, these cities are in ruin because of the Islamic State. Uh, thing that is going on. Otherwise, you go to Palmyra, Aleppo, Damascus, all these places are living history that over eight, ten thousand years ago, these cities were built by taxing Indian traders, by taxing them. So you can imagine what is the volume of traffic that must have been happening to build entire cities based on the tax that was collected from the Indian traders. Ask any Indian child, have they read anything about it? No, nothing of pride. So, <laughs> I must tell you this, I'm not saying this with pleasure, but today if the Western countries open up their visa regimes, I think seventy percent of the Indians will swim across the oceans and go away. So you're not running a nation, you're running an open prison. Nation is when I want to be here and make things happen, this is a nation. I want to run away because there's no other way I'm staying here, this is not a nation. If we want to make a nation, we have to build that pride. Pride will not suddenly drop upon us from the skies. We have to show our children what all great things we have done in the past. Okay, we have fallen here and there, but now it's once again time to bring back that glory. If we don't create that pride, if we don't create a sense of history in people's minds, particularly growing children and youth, 
how will you build… bring pride? First opportunity they get, they will leave the country <laughs> Absolutely. Actually from this my second question comes, Guruji, is uh, what do we need to sustain that? What do we need to sustain the pride and what do we need to um, do so that the, the attraction is not going abroad and leaving the country but staying on and making a difference here? See, going out of the country is not a bad thing. You go there to learn, you go to, to do business, you go there to do whatever. But are you running away from a horrible situation or are you going by choice? That is a question. I'm not saying nobody should go out, we have enough population to populate the entire world, so we can go out <laughs> Going out is not a crime. I'm saying we're escaping. Escape happens from a prison, not from a nation, isn't it? So the… the sense of escaping from the country, that should go away. If that has to go away, we cannot be forever talking about our past glory either. Past glory is good to build pride, to create a present and a future. We have to do that. Right now, India as a nation is in a position of advantage only because of the demographic dividend we have. In everything else, we are way behind most nations, let's understand this. We are. But we have a demographic, demographic dividend that we have the maximum number of youth. But if we do not cash in on this in the next fifteen to twenty years, once again it will be a slide down. It may take another fifty years or hundred years before we get that opportunity once again. So right now, in the next ten to fifteen years, what we do matters for you and the future generations of this land. Thank you, Ruchi. Uh, I have… Uh, Guruji, I've had… Uh, I want to ask you a few questions regarding… I know uh, you're done with the official mandate now <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm very intrigued. Uh, I spoke to you in the morning and uh, you were sharing about Isha Foundation's groundwork that you're doing with children because Children are our future tomorrow and to… I would want you to share what you have told me about the teaching that you were training the children to the audience because I think that's brilliant uh, what you were sharing. Can you please repeat that, Guruji, about the work I Isha Foundation is doing in educating the children? So when we say education, what is the purpose of the education that we're doing? At different stages of evolution of a culture or a nation, we need to educate people differently. Suppose we were at continuous war, we would be training our youth to fight. Right now we are in an economic pit and we see a possibility. Right now we're talking about entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship everywhere. So like this at different times, we need to train them for different things. Having said that, we know that sixty-five to seventy percent of the Indian population is in rural India. I don't know what images people who live in cities have about rural India, but it's a pathetic life today. It's not a peaceful countryside living, it's bad, okay? Nourishment is bad, infrastructure is bad, everything is bad. Life in rural India is no more that idyllic, poetic stuff, it is not. Because we try to shift from <clears throat> what is called a subsistence farming to commercial farming, it should have been done in a planned way, in a time-bound manner. We have this problem about not having timelines for anything. Whatever it is, we don't have timelines. We think we can do it eternally. We don't plan. Huh? We don't plan, focused planning. <laughs> They're having the clock ticking <laughs> No, there's no timelines. When… when is this job going to be complete? We think we can do… Be, see, we're talking about being a developing country. We're developing, developing, developing. Tell us when will we be developed country? 
if we are developing, at some point we must become developed, isn't it? Is there a target timeline? Okay, by this year, we plan to be a developed country and these are the goals. There is no such thing, we are going on developing. Like this, agriculture moving from subsistence to cash farming, it should have been done in a planned, time-bound way. We just let it be like that. So these people who had one acre, two acres, three acres of land, they were growing what they need on their land and they were eating well, they had no money, they were in rags, they had no drinking water, no electricity, but they were robust. A village person means he was robust. Today you go into the village, they have drinking water, they have electricity. Some villages still don't have, but largely they have. Everybody has a cell phone, they have internet kiosks. But you will see sixty percent of the rural population in India has shrunk like this. Their skeletal system has not grown to full size because they're malnourished. When they were eating food grown on their land, they ate variety of things. Today he's growing sugar cane, he gets cash in his hand, he comes and watches your cinema <laughs> or gets drunk. <laughs> Not wrong, I'm saying that's the only entertainment he has, let him watch <laughs> There's nothing else in his life, either a cricket match or a cinema or drink. There's really nothing else. I mean, what, is, what else is there in the village? A cricket match or a cinema or drink, these are the only three things which make it worthwhile living for him. Otherwise, everything is dreary, hard work, no result. When we did agriculture as subsistence farming, they… if we… today we are plowing means there is a plowing song, to, tomorrow we are uh, weeding means weeding song, planting means planting song, like this there were harvest means harvest songs and dance. There was a community, with that they were doing agriculture. Today you go into the village, two, two acres are all barbed wire fenced, my land is my land, your land is your land. I won't let you step into my land and I… you… I can't step into your land. You can't run agriculture like this for this kind of population. It needs a community, it needs a certain joy, it needs a certain involvement and relationship. You just want to do commercial thing, then you should have done something else. You should have merged everybody's lands and run big farms. Running one and a half acre, two acre farms commercially is senseless is absolutely senseless because one and a half acres, you make it profitable and see, let me see, you… ultimately you will hang one day, that's what is happening. Not one or two, when hundreds and thousands of farmers are hanging, why are we not getting the point that this is not practical? It is not practical, it's not because of one calamity, it is the entire thing is a calamity. Unless your land tract is large enough, there is no way to make agriculture profitable, there is no way. And if it's large enough, you need a community. Today everybody comes and plows in my land, tomorrow all of us go… go and plow in your land, this is how things were happening. Now for everything I have to pay money, when I pay everything, in the end all I have is debt. After five years of debt piling up, all I have is a two-meter rope. Yes, it's very unfortunate and terrible. Okay. So, the education for them is only to get out of this economic pit. So, at six, they will start English language and computers. Within one year, all of them are speaking fluent English in our schools. Sixty percent of them are going to school, this is the first generation going to school, but they are fluently speaking in English, you should see the joy in the parents' faces because they think their children have been to another planet. <laughs> they come home and they start talking in English. <laughs> it's an unbelievable scene, it's something that you must see, tears will come to you if you enter the school. That is one form of schooling where mainly towards employment, mainly towards moving them out of that situation. Another form of education is we have Isha Home School which is uh, for the affluent, which is run by highly trained volunteer teachers. And this is a household kind of school where every twenty children live with a committed couple who bring them up till from age of six to a certain point. All schooling happens largely in the home except for labs, playgrounds and libraries. 
From eighth standard, they moved to the high school which is there. Our eleventh and twelfth is not two years, we made it three years because we are bringing so much talent into them in terms of music, art, theater, leadership, business, various aspects so that when they step out into their undergrad, they are very mature and competent people. So I said one year extra, if you want to do schooling with us, it is not twelve years, it is thirteen years. So you cross the bad number also <laughs> It's really brilliant. Goodness. And another form of education is where there is no academics, these children come at six and they have to commit for twelve years stay. Here we teach only yoga, Kalari Paitu, classical music, classical dance, Sanskrit language and English language. This is focused just to build the human body and the human brain to its fullest capability without any intent. This is the most stupid thing is asking a three-year-old child, what will you become, what will you become? I want to be a doctor at the age of three <laughs> So without thinking what I will become, just growing this body and growing this brain to the fullest capability with utmost balance. You will see these children, if you come and see them, they can sit like this unmoving for five, six hours, wow. okay? Wow. Age of twelve, fifteen years of age, wow. they will simply sit like this unmoving for five, six hours at a time. Wow. That's a level of stability we brought into them. <laughs> wow. I… Guruji… Actually, Most adults cannot do it. <laughs> I know, I know. I mean, forget five, six hours, I think for one minute is also difficult. <laughs> Two minutes is difficult. Uh, I, uh, one minute is a bad case. <laughs> A lot of practice, Guruji, I have um, uh, had to meditate. Um, the other question which I want to ask Guruji is c pertaining to this um, calm in clamor, mm -hmm. uh, which is about, you know, in today's world with so much happening, life throwing constant challenges, whether it's health related, whether it's relationship related, whether it's career demands and the constant struggle, uh, let's forget the bigger terrorism and all that news, but in our own personal day-to-day -day life, there's so much of pressure, there's so much of challenges that we face. Um, um, how do we uh, keep calm amidst so much of chaos? Anyway, let me put this to context. Life, even though a lot of organization needs to happen in our country. Never before life was as organized as it is today. You're talking about relationships, problems and you know, uncertainties. I want you to know, if you lived here a thousand years ago, if your man or your child went out, you never know whether they'll come back or not, okay? There is always a tiger lurking right there, there is always an elephant wanting to stamp him. And he did not go out, if he went out for two days, you sat here praying, wanting him to come back because he didn't WhatsApp you and tell you every step of what he's doing <laughs> He just vanished, he just vanished for days or months, you never know whether he's going to come back or not. Every time he stepped out, not for war. Even for business, even for work, if he went out, you don't know whether he will come back. For the first time, you can keep track of him <laughs> So I'm saying, <laughs> life is more certain than ever before. We have just become less competent to handle. If you n had to navigate your way through the jungle, it was different. Today, navigating through the Delhi traffic, there is road rage. Yesterday, today, some incidents are there, people are killing each other. People are killing each other just because they're not able to handle the traffic chaos. I can imagine if I left you in a rainforest, I can imagine the terror you'll go through because you won't know a thing about how to navigate. Every moment you have to be alert and find your way. There is no traffic policeman pointing this way or that way for you. When to stop, when to go, somebody has to tell you now. Then if you didn't stop at the right time, you would be dead. I'm saying life is more organized than ever before on this planet. Don't complain. 
you have more comforts, more conveniences than any generation ever had, yes or no? Please all of you, yes or no? Aren't you enjoying more material comfort than your parents and your grandparents? Unless your grandfather was a maharaja or something. <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> we… we… life is better than ever before, but we have lost the ability within ourselves because somewhere we think by fixing the outside everything will be okay. No, by fixing the outside, comfort will come, convenience will come, well-being will not come. If you're seeking well-being, in is the only way out. If you lose the ability to look inward, then clamor will be there on the outside. Clamor is good on the outside. Why I'm saying clamor is good is, suppose you're running an industry, I'm sure many of you running some industry or business or whatever. In your industry, you want clamor or you want silence? Hello? You want clamor, they love the clamor. Do you understand? Suppose tomorrow morning they walked into their industry, everything is quiet. Oh, that's terror for them <laughs> They don't want calm in their industry. So we must understand these are two different dimensions. One is external situation, another is inner situation. Calm is of inner nature. Clamor is of the material world. More clamor, better we are doing, isn't it? Yes or no? More clamor, better we are doing. Yesterday somebody is telling me, Sadhguru, no development is happening, Prime Minister is going on saying things will happen, nothing is happening, only thing that's happening is more pollution. I said more pollution means something is happening. <laughs> yes or no? More pollution means more people are driving, more machines are working, something is happening. Only thing is we have to see how to make it conducive for our lives, that's different. But more pollution means something is happening, isn't it? If nothing is happening, there'll be no pollution, yes. <laughs> if all your industries, businesses, everything come to a standstill, of course pollution will come down. But that's not the way you want it to come down, isn't it? You want clamor on the outside and calm is of your nature. But you have never explored what is the nature of who I am. In the sense, people are thinking by fixing this, 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 this will be okay. No, we can put you in a palace, you can still be miserable. People have hung themselves in extreme poverty. People have hung themselves in palaces too, isn't it? So, creating a palace or extreme comfort levels does not mean you will be okay. You will be okay only when you know, understand and handle the mechanics of this life properly. As you know all of you running industry and business, you understand, unless you understand the mechanics of what is happening in your business, you can't run it well, it's only by accident. Similarly with this, unless you understand and conduct this properly, you will not know what this is only by accident. When you are happy or peaceful by accident, then you will lose it on the road. <laughs> Delhi streets are testing. <laughs> so, what do we do to keep calm inside, Guruji? <laughs> See, there is no clamor inside, it's calm. It is just that you do not know what is inside, what is outside. Whatever happens outside, in compulsive reaction, inside also it happens. What is happening inside is only a reflection, right? Whatever is happening outside, the reflection is happening inside. Now if you… if… Uh, if I hold a mirror to you, the mirror shows a beautiful face. If I hold it to myself, it shows an ugly face, what to do? <laughs> What to do, that's how it is. But your face will not stick to the mirror, isn't it? No. So now I want to look beautiful, so I will show the mirror to you first and then keep the mirror in my home. I'm not going to look beautiful. No. Yes? So nothing stuck to the mirror. That is the importance and significance of the mirror. It is supposed to show you things just the way it is. 
It is not supposed to… Sh when you ask a painter, Satish is here, when you ask a painter to paint your picture, you ask him to do little this and this and make yourself little more beautiful, everything. That's okay because after we are gone, they see us really beautiful. <laughs> but in the mirror, you stand in front of the mirror because you want to see it the way it is. Yes or no? Yes. That's the idea of standing in front of the mirror. I know we have heard… Uh, heard stories of uh, who is the prettiest of all in front of the mirror, all that stuff. But the essence of standing in front of the mirror is to see reality as it is, not to see a pretty picture. That is the nature of your mind too. This is not about painting a pretty picture. This is about simply seeing things the way they are. If you learn to see things just the way they are, you will know how to navigate. If you see things the way you want it, then you will not be able to navigate because you're not in reality, first of all <laughs> Guruji, it is exceptionally difficult to see things as they are because our I will egos, tell you why it's difficult. No, no, no. Always want where is to your see e us as pretty you, and you beautiful. You show me… you show me where is your ego, I'll fix it right away <laughs> Where is it? Uh, in the mind. Where in the mind, tell me? Uh, not in the brain but in the mind, in the mm. idea of ego. No, you're saying something like this, where is it <laughs> So… Um, so the thing is just this, hmm. sometimes Manisha is very beautiful, a wonderful Then you say, I am a wonderful person, sometimes she is nasty. Then you turn back and say, oh, that was my ego, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so Miss Ego is a fall guy. Whenever you're nasty, Miss Ego will come. Hmm. Whenever you're wonderful, only you are there <laughs> So we are not so owning <laughs> our bad side. Where we must settle this. Are… is there only one person in this body or two? Multiple persons <laughs> Oh, this is schizophrenia <laughs> If there is more than one in your… here within you, Either you're schizophrenic or you're possessed. <laughs> that means either a psychiatrist or an exorcist <laughs> What it means is when you say, I'm an individual, we must understand the root word for individual is indivisible. Indivisible. Yes, that means this cannot be further divided. Only if you come to this, that this is an individual, then you will understand the fundamental, if I'm wonderful, it's me, if I'm nasty, it's me, Absolutely. if I'm beautiful, it's me, if I'm ugly, it's me. Absolutely. If you come to terms with this, your life will be a constant step forward to become better and better. Whenever I'm wonderful, it's me, when I'm nasty, it's you, well, it'll stay that way forever and it'll grow. <laughs> so, uh, Guruji, would… would… I'll just take this little more. Um, does it… that means that when we see in a mirror uh, an ugly side, which I was saying as an ego, uh, we should be able to accept that? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying <clears throat> what you call as a human being is not an established thing, it is a becoming. It's not really… we must call this human becoming. <laughs> you have to become one. Because in the evolutionary scale of things, you know Charles Darwin? Yes. He told you at one time you were a monkey, him not me, okay <laughs> <laughs> He told you at one time you were a monkey and then you became a human being and all this stuff. So he goes about saying a goat became a giraffe and it took so many million years, could have become. Or a pig could have become an elephant, it took so many more million years. but. Between a monkey and a human being, it happened rather quickly. It didn't take enough time, I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> to, <laughs> to such a point that <laughs> anthropologists today believe that there is a missing link. <laughs> they believe there's a missing link because it happened so quickly. <laughs> See, between the DNA of a chimpanzee, and the human beings that we are, the DNA difference is only 1.23 percent. Not much of a difference, <laughs> isn't it <laughs> 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 
So physiologically, physiologically we are not very far away from a chimpanzee. But intellectually, cerebral capabilities and in terms of our awareness and consciousness, we are worlds apart. Or in other words, you have an intelligence for which you don't have a stable enough foundation. So the entire yogic system is just to create a stable foundation. A stable foundation means any foundation or any building, if it has to stand for a long time and in a stable manner, it must be geometrically correct. So entire yogic system is about aligning your physical geometry to the cosmic geometry so that you have a stable enough platform upon which this intelligence can blossom. When I say stable enough platform, today people, wherever you go, people talk about tension, anxiety, rage on the road, all kinds of nonsense. You can call it by many names, but essentially what's happening is your own intelligence is turned against you. That's all that's happened. Why is your intelligence turning against you? Because you don't have a stable enough platform to handle it. See, if somebody comes and tries to hurt you physically, you have some defense. Suppose your own hand started beating you up, how to stop this? Only somebody else has to stop it, <laughs> isn't it? So right now, you… If, if you sit… see, if you are going through some kind of suffering because I am causing the suffering to you, right now I am poking you and you are suffering, it's different. But look at most human beings, when they are alone, they can suffer. If you are suffering when you are alone, obviously you are in bad company, isn't it? <laughs> yes. So your own intelligence has turned against you. Your body, your mind, your energies must work for you. What have you done about that? If you don't do anything about it, your own hands will start punching you. There is no solution for this from outside, unless we either handcuff you or amputate you. That's what they're trying to do today. In some ways, what do you think all these drugs are? They're trying to amputate you in some way, mentally, put you down. <laughs> Guruji, that takes me to another question. Almost what you have described is, is almost like a cancer because it grows from the… within the body. Mm -hmm. The body… your own body turns against you. So it's the same thing. With it's a so organized crime from within. From within <laughs> <laughs> See, we have cells and cells, over hundred billion cells they say. All these cells are essentially coded and, you know, geared for health, for survival mainly. Their own individual survival and the survival of the organism. A few of them take shortcuts they want to survive upon others, it's crime, you know. So there is a pickpocket, what is his business? What you took one month to earn, he wants to pick it up in one day. But he's also part of the society till he's caught, mm. all right <laughs> Now if all the pickpockets of the country got together and they came to Delhi, mm. now everybody's pockets will be gone because now it's organized. So right now, what you ca call as cancer is just this. In everybody's body, there are cancerous cells. When they get organized and get focused in one place, then it becomes a serious problem to a point where it can take one's life. What is the solution? There are many things to say. First of all, crime flourishes where there is no order in the system, yes? criminals in the society will flourish if the law enforcement is not in order. So there is a defense mechanism in our system. Are we keeping it well? Are we bombarding it with all kinds of stimulants, intoxicants, everything, and then we're expecting our defense mechanism to work? It won't work like that. We must understand every stimulant and every intoxicant we consume in some way dents our defense mechanism. People think defense mechanism is only for external infections. No, even to contain the internal criminals in the body, the defense mechanism works. So a simple thing is, 
you know, in the yogic system, this is a simple logic. These cancerous cells in our body, they consume usually about twenty-seven to twenty-eight times of food than the normal cells. So, if you space out your meal, an ideal spacing between one meal and the next in the yogic culture is eight to twelve hours. If you space out eight hours meals, you will see the cancerous cells will all die by themselves because they cannot survive without food. Other cells will survive. So always we fixed it, morning one meal, evening one meal, no in between eating. And once in a way, every month, twice a month or once a month, people are practicing one full day, no food. These are simple ways to control this. Apart from that, there are various other things. Above all, if your mind and body is in a certain ease, these will not survive. If your mind and body is in a certain sense of strife, then these will survive and not only survive, they will flourish. If the society is in strife, organized crimes rise. rise. If the society is in order, very little crime happens. The same is true with our physiological structure. Guruji, I want to say uh, for uh, basic normal… Uh, um, to keep… to… how do I… how do we all utilize this wisdom in our day-to-day -day practice, Guruji? See, there are many practices to bring the necessary… we're using the word calm today, if we want to bring that necessary calm on all levels of life. Calm does not mean just being little peaceful in your mind. Calm means right now, I'm speaking and sitting here, I've had a breakfast. If you check my pulse, it's somewhere around fifty-six, fifty-eight. Suppose I'm on an empty stomach and I sit quietly, this will go down to thirty-four, thirty-six because the entire system is at ease. Whatever is at ease will last longer. It's going at a less RPM, that means it will definitely last longer. It's not about how long you live, but how well can you live is the question. Very true, Guruji, very, very true. Okay, before we begin other things, Guruji, I… me being an actor and coming from performing arts and creative field, how important is meditation um, in performing arts, in direction, acting, theatre? See, I think people go into art and music because unconsciously somewhere they touch moments of meditativeness in what they're doing. If that element is not there, I don't think music, art, all these things would be worthwhile. Somewhere there are moments of meditativeness. So, let me take away the word meditation because the word meditation in English language doesn't mean anything. If I sit with my eyes closed, I can do japa, tapa, dharana, dhyana, samadhi, shunya, any number of things. But in English language, if I sit with my eyes closed, they will say he is meditating. By closing my eyes, I could be doing any one of those things or you might have just mastered the art of sleeping in vertical postures <laughs> You know, people learn this in conferences <laughs> I hope so, uh, That's why the lighting is kept like this, you know, <laughs> <laughs> not to disturb the rear section of the hall <laughs> So, meditativeness means in some way, if you sit here, your mind is out here, your body is here, what you experience as myself is little away from these two things. That means you found a little space between yourself and your body, between yourself and your mind. There are only two problems, there are two kinds of sufferings in your life, physical and mental. Do you know any other kind of suffering? No. Once there is a space between you and your body, between you and your mind, this is the end of suffering. Once there is no fear of suffering, that no matter what happens, this is how I will be. Once that assurance is there within you, then you will walk your life full stride. Whether creativity or industry or business or whatever kind of life, you will walk full stride. When there is fear of suffering, you will take only half steps. And when do… how do I become that, Guruji? <laughs> <laughs> how 
How… how start… start a simple process called inner engineering. What we need is thirty hours of focus time. We format it in different ways, in seven days, in three days, three full days and many different ways. But what we actually need is thirty hours of focus time. We create a, a vehicle for you so that you can turn inward. Why I am saying you need a vehicle to turn inward is, right now the five sense organs which are the only means of perception you have, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, this is the only way you know life, this is the only way you exist right now. You know that you exist only because you can see, hear, smell, taste and touch. Suppose you fell asleep, you don't know whether the world exists or not or you exist or not, isn't it? So, these sense organs are essentially outward bound in the sense you can see what is around you, you can never roll your eyeballs inward and scan yourself. You can hear this, so much activity you cannot hear this. If an ant crawls upon this hand, you can feel it, so much blood flowing, you cannot feel it. In the very nature of things, sense organs are outward bound. Yes. But your experience entirely happens within you. Right now, do you see where I am? Guruji, I saw you and you too. No, 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 do you see me now? <laughs> You have already seen that, <laughs> yes. So, this image is a reflection and happening in your mind, within yourself. Yes. You hear me within you, you see me within you, you've seen the world within you. You have never seen, heard, tasted, touched anything outside of you. It all happens only within you, yes. never happens outside of you. Or in other words, the entire experience of life is being generated from within. When entire experience of life is being generated for the within, at least what is happening within you must happen the way you want it, isn't it? Absolutely. The clamor in the world will not happen your way because it's all of us put together, this clamor. Little bit will happen my way, little your way, little somebody's way, it's fine. But this calm is my way because this is an internal thing. What happens within you must be hundred percent your way nobody else's way, isn't it? What happens outside, everybody has a stake. But that's the most difficult, difficult part to be It is not to... difficult. Right now, suppose I ask you to unscrew a screw in this furniture mm -hmm. with your hands, mm -hmm. what will happen? You'll use your nails, you'll lose them, you'll use your teeth and you'll lose them, but the screw won't come. True. But if I give you a screwdriver, Effortlessly you will do it, isn't it? Yes. So what is needed is a tool, that's tools. why I said a vehicle to turn inward. There are no tools, that's why people think it's so difficult. So inner engineering is a tool, it's not a teaching, it's not a philosophy, it's not an ideology or belief system, it's a tool that you learn to use. Okay Guruji, I think uh <coughs> Maybe it's time to ask questions um, from the audience. Um, I'm sure some of them want to have, want to ask some questions. If there isn't, then I don't want to lose this opportunity. I have many questions, so just let me know. So, um, there are a lot of people here with questions. Would you like to point them out or do we hand the mic directly to them? Uh, I think you should give the mic to them. Directly to them. Okay, we'll start with you, sir. I request everyone to keep your questions as concise as possible and it should be a question and not a comment. Please begin. Um, Namaskaram Sadhguru, this is Vishnu from Coimbatore. Um, how would you define India? India is a. it's like a kaleidoscope, it's a conscious chaos. At one time, we consciously created some chaos, intentionally. But unfortunately, some people are overdoing it today. They made it their profession to create chaos <laughs> We need to handle that. But why this conscious chaos is? Because we understood organization in a different way. If you step out of this hotel, you will see a manicured garden. But every day, ten people are working on it to keep it that way. Three months if nobody attended to that, there will be no garden left. But you come into the jungle, you come into the forest, there is a different kind of organization and order there. 
which million years later it will still be there without any maintenance. So something that lasts a million years, is it better organized? Something that cannot last even a month without maintenance is better organized. So we organize this culture with a certain element of conscious chaos. But today, because your education systems are totally westernized, which is all straight lines, you're trying to fit India into these straight lines, it will not fit, you will only be frustrated. And in trying to fix that, you will destroy the nation. We need to understand, we have allowed a certain room for chaos so that it's an evolving process. It is not a fixed thing, it is not ruled by commandments. There is nowhere in this country where there has been given a moral code to you. There is nowhere in this country where they told you, this is God and if you go to him, all problems will be solved. There is no such thing. There is no a God. First of all, there is no the God in this country. There is no the heaven in this country, everybody can create their own, you know. We are given the freedom to create our own gods. Out of this came the technologies of God-making, we created thirty-three million gods and goddesses because there is no certainty. The idea of a kaleidoscope is wonder, seeking. So we have always been a land of seekers, not a land of believers. Now you are trying to become land of believers, I see we believe something. No. <laughs> Every day, everybody these days are saying, we believe, we believe, because they are trying to bring a westernized idea of organization. You must understand all the violence, all the nonsense, all the most horrendous things that happen on this planet is always in terms of one man's belief versus another man's belief. So we never believed anything. Even if God came and spoke, we questioned him, isn't it? This is the nature of this culture. Everywhere else, if God spoke, they said, this is it, this is the commandment. In this country, if God came and spoke, we still debated with him, we questioned him. Unless it's logically correct, we did not accept it. This has been the ethos of this culture. This causes a certain amount of chaos, but this chaos is evolution of human consciousness too. Every culture has been created because of its geographical conditions, because of certain survival factors and other historical events that happen in that place, culture gets shaped. We also have some element of that, but a large element of this <coughs> this culture is about consciously seeking what is beyond all this. Because of this, in this culture, God, heaven were never important things. Our highest ideal is mukti or liberation or freedom. Freedom has always been the highest goal, not God, because we know even if we go to heaven and sit next to God, in three days we'll get bored with him also <laughs> Yes, we will, isn't it? And what… do you have any proof that you're not already in heaven and messing it up? Yeah. I'm Absolutely. asking, do you have proof? You don't have proof, maybe you're in heaven and you're messing it completely. Yes, that's a reality, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> Check. We are all the way at the back. So Check. Maybe this is heaven and we are messing it. Yes. That's a. Hello. Hello. Brilliant. Yeah. If you have Guruji. calm, you will enjoy the heaven. Hello. If you are in clamor within yourself, you think you're in hell. What to do? <laughs> I'm going to have to request everyone with the mics to kindly hold on, please. Kindly hold on. There are multiple people with mics. Are they going to go all the way at the back here? My hand is up all the way at the back. Just handing the mic over to this person. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Vabhav uh, Sadhguru at the last here. Okay. So I just wanted to tell you that we are not sleeping out here at the last, so <laughs> in the vert uh, vertical situation. So uh, my question is, uh, you know, uh, India is a young nation and you know, one of the biggest problem which we are facing today is uh, the health disorders which the young nation is actually, uh, you know, going through. The lifestyle disorders are increasing by the day and and this is actually going to affect the productivity of the nation as we go forward. So my question to you is that uh, in spirituality and according to you, what can we do to manage the stress and manage these lifestyle disorders and lifestyle issues as we go forward? Because that's the least time which we give to ourselves. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to correct the question, we are not an young nation. We are the oldest nation on the planet, okay? 
because if you're only looking at India's constitution or a political setup as nationhood, yes, we are a young nation. But even ten thousand years ago, people outside this country, though inside the country we had over two hundred political entities, people from outside called the entire nation as Hindustan or Bharat or whatever. People recognized both inside and outside, this is one nation, though it was ruled by many political heads or systems as such. Because we became a nation, not because of our political bosses, not because of a certain constitution, we became a nation because we never had a belief in anything. We have always been seekers, we always wondered about life, we sought, what is the truth? Every generation has to seek what is the truth about my life. Well, Krishna has already said it, maybe what he said is true for him. With all due respect, we have to explore for ourselves what is the nature of the truth of our life. This is the freedom that this nation offered to us, so we were bound by these strings of seeking, not believing. Usually most nations are made out of sameness. We did not fall for that mediocrity, that we have to be all same to be one. Each one can be different. Within the same family, five people worship five different gods, but no problem with us. So this is a unique nation, this should not be destroyed, its ethos of everybody can be whatever the hell they want to be, and still we are one nation. This nation has existed for the longest period of time simply because of this lack of rigidity within itself. Now we are trying to put rigid lines, if you do that, it won't last long. It's very important to know this. About health, we've always known how to be healthy. If you believe for this 1.2 billion people, you are going to create a healthcare system like United States has, <laughs> you, you don't know what you're talking about. You've just not seen the country, nor have you seen United States nor have you looked at the systems that United States has. Even a nation like United States, which gets its wealth from many sources, do you understand? United States makes money, no matter who makes money in the world, do you understand? They structured the nation in such a way, whoever makes money in the world, in some way they will make money, all right? In spite of that, three trillion dollar bill of their health care is going to sink that nation if they continue the same way for another few years. Yes? It's going to sink that nation because three trillion dollars, it's bigger than our budget. So if you think you're going to create a health care system like that, it's going to be a disaster. I think the present government has done one significant thing that is the Ayush ministry. It is still not well funded, but once it is well funded and if we manage to roll it out the way we should, because Isha Foundation was the first pilot project of our Ayush about eight years ago in the Namakal district in Tamil Nadu. It produced phenomenal results for one district, just teaching people how to be healthy in rural India. And we started hundreds of herbal gardens with which people are taught in public places, these gardens were raised, where people can go and make use of the herbs for different day-to-day -day ailments that they come to. Something very serious happens, they can go to the hospital. I want you to know, just one or two generations ago, when your grandmothers were alive, if a child got a stomach ache, nobody went to the doctor. No. Child got little fever, nobody went to the doctor. They knew what to do. Today, for everything you're going to the doctor, because it's become an industry. As you say, it is not health, it is medicine, okay? It is about fueling pharma pharmaceutical industries. I'm not against pharmaceuticals when it is necessary. Pharmaceuticals means you're chemically bombing the system, okay? It's chemical bombing. When it's really drastic and it's necessary, we must do it. But if we do every day, we know today what is the harm we are causing to the system by doing that. If you want to bring health to this nation, you must bring back ancient systems, yoga on all levels. On this International Yoga Day, we are taking yoga to over ten thousand schools in India. Manisha is saying that she will take me to Nepal and uh, <laughs> in all the schools in Nepal. It's my honor. So because this has to come at an early age, your health should be your responsibility, not your doctor's responsibility, isn't it? 
to stay healthy, is it your business or somebody else's business? Government's business to keep you healthy? No, it's my business to keep myself healthy. How… what should I eat? How should I live? How should I sit? How should I breathe? What should I do with myself is something that I must be concerned about. The American way of thinking is, okay, I paid my insurance, take care of me, make me healthy. Every day I will eat bad things, every day I will do bad things, but you keep me healthy. This not going to work for this nation with 1.2 billion people and the kind of economy that we have and the kind of resources that we have, if we go that way, we will kill millions of people out of our ignorance. On this note, Guruji, that health is our business, not anybody else's, I think that they have signed me and they're saying the time is up. But it's such an honor to talk to you, Guruji. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Cape Pride 2016. A big round of applause to these people on stage. Can you the man on stage, sir? Can you the man? Ma'am, if you can just stay on stage for a second. Friends, you know, we have these lovely boards on the side which says um, take steps, take effort, take courage, take inspiration, take heart, take joy, take strength. And our wonderful creative team, you know, had planned that for each session, we'll have a theme. Little did we know that there'll be one session where we have everything. So it's been an absolute, absolute honor, Guruji. Thank you so much for being here. And ma'am, thank you so much for handling this entire session so beautifully. Friends, I would like to share with you, um, Young Indians with great pride has launched a mission this year to eradicate from India the evil of child sexual abuse. It's a shocking fact that one in every two children in our country is sexually abused from the ages of 5 to 18. Towards that mission, um, Guruji, ma'am, we would love for your support, for your endorsement of this mission. It's called Project Masoom, and we only request um, Raghu, our National Vice Chair, if we can just have a picture, just in this. I'm 100% uh, this needs to be checked and this evil of misusing children at various places, at homes, at schools, on the street. But at the same time, uh, I would like to caution all of you. Uh, I know just now he said one in two children. No, it's not true. Somebody is making up statistics like this. If you spell out these kind of statistics, everybody becomes a suspect. There will be no childhood left, too much caution, too much fear about it. We will destroy Nobody can just pick up a child out of joy anymore. Already we are hesitating. You know, even if an eight-year-old girl comes, you can't simply hug her because uh, we are afraid who will say what. Let's not take the country and the world in that direction. Yes, there are bad things happening. We have to stop the damn things. But at the same time, let's not kill everything that's beautiful in our lives by believing every second child is abused. It's not true. They're taking statistics in wrong places. Across the country, if you take it, generally girl children in India are super protected, which is being seen as too much restriction in today's world, but they're super protected in most families. And uh, definitely the cause is something that I stand by and we must do. At the same time, we still want to have the joy that if we see a child, we can pick up the child, we can hug the child. Let that freedom and joy be there in our life, let's not lose it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to say. No, sir. Uh, it's okay. Oh, so, so, sorry, sir. I got co um, carried away in the excitement. Um, would like to invite Sri Kansri Narayan, YI's past national chair, to please um, a small token of our um, affection, of our regard for ma'am and sir. <laughs> 